Okay, so I'm going to talk to you about uh, the behavior of gamma norm under iterates uh, of a Hamiltonian diffeomorphism. morphism. I'll define uh, some of the things uh, that will be players in the talk. And as you see, actually, as you will see, we know very little about this. So, so I, I guess the goal of the talk is more like tell you a little bit about what we know, what we can say, some questions, and um, maybe to convince you that it is actually interesting question to understand uh, in many instances whether uh, how gamma norm behaves under iterates, uh, under iterations of a Hamiltonian diffeomorphism. So the topic of behavior of the gamma norm under iteration. So let's write it this way. Uh, a bit later, I'm also going to be interested mainly in lower bounds rather than upper bounds on this thing. So before also I forget, when I uh, state the results, they will be joined with um, Erman Cinelli. and Victor Ginsburg. OK, so the setting here, as uh, we have a symplectic manifold, OK? Uh, we don't need to assume it's closed, but we can also assume it's closed. Maybe it is just simpler, soon I will maybe contradict to this. Uh, if not, we need to assume some kind of nice behavior at infinity. Sphere, CPN, surface of hydrogen is all good. And we have a Hamiltonian diffeomorphism. This is, by definition, the time one map of a Hamiltonian flow generated by some Hamiltonian. So let's write it this way. A time-dependent flow defined by Hamilton equations. Uh, I'm also going to assume that H is one periodic. And then uh, the set of all these guys form the well-known object of Ham. Okay, so on hand we have two very interesting, remarkable norms. Okay. Um, One of them which will be, so these are conjugation invariant. Okay. So one of them will be uh, less of interest to us, but it's still important uh, to keep in mind for some inequalities and stuff. Uh, so this is the Hofer norm. Okay, this is easier to define, so you just, uh, let's just remember how that works. So I need to take the um, oscillation, so maximum of HT minus minimum of HT um, DT, and then I take the infimum over all generating Hamiltonians, phi H1 equals phi. So it's this way. Um, so the Hofer norm, uh, okay, so some references here. So for R to N goes back to Hofer. And then rational symplectic manifolds goes back to Leonid's work. And then Lalonde the Magda for general. So this is the non-degeneracy of this norm. Um, and now we have the spectral norm. 
which is a bit less uh, sort of intuitive. So one can think about the spectral norm or the so-called gamma norm as the um, sort of difference between homological maximum and minimum. I can think about it this way. So uh, let's write it. So I'm going to write it this way. So gamma of phi. This time I'm going to take the infimum over all generating Hamiltonians uh, by looking at the spectral invariance associated with the fundamental class. So C H plus C H inverse. Okay, like this. So this goes back to Viterbo for R2n. And then for a spherical, syntactically a spherical manifolds to Schwarz and O, of course, in the general case. Okay. Um, these are uh, the sort of key norms we work when we work with Hamiltonian diffeomorphisms. So for example, I don't know which one this is going to turn out to be. Again, it's not that easy to calculate the, this thing in general, but if you have a small Hamiltonian, <coughs> they will all be the same thing. So gamma of phi is the same as the maximum minus the minimum. And this will be the same as the Hopper norm. Okay, so uh, of course we also have C0 norm, C1 norm, etc. on HAM. I mean, we can think about all these things for Hamiltonian diffeomorphisms, but these are the two guys that actually don't depend on any other uh, structures. Uh, some sense. So we know the following fact between these two uh, norms. We know that gamma of phi is bounded from above by the Hofer norm of H, for instance, one could use this to show the non-degeneracy of the Hofer norm, for example. Uh, again, there are many open questions, of course, concerning these uh, norms, uh, these norms, and etc. So um, let me tell you a few things. So we are going to be, as I said, interested in this talk, how this guy behaves as we iterate the Hamiltonian diffeomorphism. So um, some sort of results related uh, results, some things that have been studied from different perspectives. Um, first of all, we have, and one thing that's been looked at more extensively is the upper bounds on gamma. So <coughs> And here we have actually very little, I have to say. So this is a priori bounded from above. For CPN, this is work of Yantov and Polterovich going back to 2003. And plus some other situations, a variety of other situations, which I am not going to spell out here. And this is uh, the work of Kislev and Schilling. This is a good thing to have. <laughs> you would prove very good theorems if you knew this thing for more general syntactic minimals. But unfortunately, this is what we have. So this paper goes back to 18, I think, but it was published in 2022. So it's actually a bit earlier than that. Um, and uh, the product structure on CPN, etc., cetera, are uh, key ingredients in this, in these facts. And uh, of course, I mean, maybe it, it would be, it would make sense to also say all of these, these questions uh, will depend on the Hamiltonian diffeomorphism we consider. So you can 
uh, write down, not for CPN obviously, but for say for a torus, you can write down uh, Hamiltonian diffeomorphism, which is bounded from above, uh, for which gamma will be bounded from above under iterations, or uh, you can also write down one for which gamma uh, phi to the k goes to infinity with k. So it depends on it depends on phi, right? So another thing I wanted to say, which are kind of useful things here and used often, so how these are related to the barcodes. Okay, uh, barcodes and the boundary depth uh, of Asher. So uh, I'm sort of grateful to Yorgos and Elsa too, so who all talked a little bit about barcodes, so I'm not going to tell you the barcode, but uh, we have the fluor complex, so we have a filtration on it. It, will, it gives us a persistent module, it has the associated barcodes, so uh, this is the barcodes that I'm talking about here. And um, here you have the notion of uh, the longest finite bar, and this is introduced by Asher, it's called the boundary depth. Okay, so let's denote it by beta. Um, maybe I don't need to write uh, beta max here. So the relationship between these two guys, so maybe first I should say that um, uh, the barcode depends continuously on gamma. So Um, with respect to gamma norm, maybe this is what I mean. And another thing here to definitely mention is that for any Hamiltonian diffeomorphism phi, we have the following inequality. The longest finite bar is bounded from above um, by gamma of phi for any phi. So this is a important result also due to Kislev and Shilukin. So uh, as I said, these are uh, good things to have uh, in very non-trivial uh, applications. For instance, uh, the fact that the barcode, uh, and of course this is true for all uh, phi, so there is an a priori bound when you uh, iterate all it, uh, you know, iterate your Hamiltonian diffeomorphism, and this plays a key role in, for instance, uh, the proof of the high-dimensional Frank's theorem for CPN. So uh, this is also Igor's result. So one of the key roles here in. This basically, the, here the theorem says that the Hamiltonian uh, diffeomorphism of CPN is either m plus one or infinitely many periodic points. This was known uh, for a more general class of uh, maps for S2, that's Frank's theorem, and the higher dimensional version also referred to as the Hofer-Zener conjecture, with some possibly mild non-degeneracy condition that was proved uh, by Shilukin. Did I write there? maybe like some three, four years ago. And a key ingredient is, the, is this relation that you can bound the barcode uh, for iterations from above. Um, okay, so as I said here, we're going to be interested in uh, lower bounds. So let's do it this way. rather than the upper bound. And one of the questions is, of course, like how small can this go? 
Can it go to zero? Is it bounded away from zero? And how is it related to variety of other things <laughs> we might be interested in, be it from dynamics perspective or from simplistic topological perspective? Uh, and it turns out all of these things are related to very interesting things like the Colony conjecture, Lagrangian Poincare recurrence, and invariant sets theorems. Uh, even can go as far as things like uh, existence of non-zero, non-mentioning Gromovitan invariants, I would say. Okay, so. Let's define the following notion just so that our job will be easier, a little bit, notation must. So I'm going to denote this gamma bar. Gamma bar of phi uh, is by definition going to be the lower limit of phi under iterations. Okay. So for example, um, is there a situation we know that this is going to be zero? Of course. So if you have an element phi whose sum iteration becomes identity, like you can take a rational like rotation of the sphere kind of situation, uh, what is referred to as torsion elements of M, uh, then of course, this is going to be zero. In fact, this is also going to be zero for any uh, rotation of the sphere, I would say. So gamma of phi to the k will be, uh, if you rotate by k alpha, gamma of phi to the k will be uh, something like that. If phi is, say, this. Uh, OK, so this is the. Uh, distance to the closest integer, obviously. So these two will have, so this is going to be the gamma of phi to the k. Uh, if alpha is say irrational, this again is going to be zero by the Kronecker theorem, okay? So gamma of bar phi k is again zero. So this is say for, I am in S2. I mean, it's true. I know it's saying the fractional part. Fractional part, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, isn't it the same? No, when you wrote K. Anyway, yes, you are right. <laughs> Let me see if there is anything else uh, I want to say. OK, so of course, <laughs> uh, it's a bit less obvious to give uh, maybe examples where this is going to be uh, positive or bounded from, above, bounded from below. Uh, but it turns out that more often than not, it is actually going to be the case. So um, maybe. Uh, In other words, this is bounded away from zero. And um, we will see that this, will, this is, the, however, the case quite often. Um, I want to say this point. 
Okay, so this is sort of the, the situation we are in, but uh, what I maybe would like to do is before I move any further, let me sort of look at the whole thing in a slightly broader, uh, from a slightly broader perspective. Because after all, we are not the only ones who look at such things in simplistic uh, geometry. These objects have been studied in, in particularly in dynamics uh, quite extensively. So what you can do, uh, you can just, let's forget about we are in the symplectic world. Uh, we could take just some any manifold. So, okay. And we could take a group, let's call it G, of say some smooth maps of M, so, so, so C of some C infinity diffuse of M. Not necessarily all of them. So volume preserving, maybe I don't know something isotopic to identity. Uh, it could be in the symplectic case. Um, you can look at Hamiltonian diffeomorphisms, etc. So some a group formed by some diffeomorphisms of phi, depending on the context, obviously. And then you can put a norm, which will be the, by definition, distance to the identity. Of G. And then, uh, for example, C0 norm, CK norm, gamma norm, Hofer norm, however you like, again, depending on the context. And you can, or CK norm, etc. And then we can uh, ask the very same question. So we can uh, pick a phi here, and this thing is falling. Hold on, OK. Um, on this group, and one can study what happens to this guy under iterations. So. Um, okay, so one may again be interested in, let me put this up there. Whether or not the lower limit is going to be zero. It's just one of the things. Okay, so, um, Let's give a definition here. It's maybe the right time to define it now that we are in this broader uh, situation. So one can call uh, an element in G. So I am going to go against the grain and call it an approximate identity with respect to this norm. This is commonly, will be referred to as uh, rigid, actually, rather than approximate identities, uh, also known as rigid, at least in dynamics. If the following happens, if uh, uh, there exists a sequence ki going to infinity so that uh, this guy goes to zero as k goes to infinity. Okay, so for instance, in our case, uh, you would call a Hamiltonian, say, diffeomorphism a gamma ai or gamma rigid. if this lower limit is equal to zero, okay? So now, um, yes, I mean, these things have been extensively studied in dynamics, particularly with respect to norms. Um, it's kind of a rich situation here. Um,
particularly concerning the norms uh, C0, C1, and more generally CR norms. I will write down a few things related to them, and there are like some non-trivial uh, sort of consequences or relations between whether or not entropy is zero, is related to being, I don't know, a C0 AI or CK AI, whether or not something has a dense orbit, something is minimal, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so, uh, and this is where the terminology of uh, rigid comes from. So in case anyone is wondering why I'm not calling them rigid is, the thing is that the properties that we usually uh, sort of consider here, for instance, being gamma AI, is just not stable at all and feels like rigid is something you also use in the same dynamical systems for some kind of stability, stable properties. <laughs> so it feels like there is a bit of a mismatch. So uh, in, in our, one of our works, Victor and I started calling them approximate identities, but this is what people refer to as uh, C0 rigid, gamma rigid, et cetera, that this limit goes to zero. Okay, so I will, in the talk, I, I will use them uh, exchangeably. So another thing to say maybe, of course, this definition can be modified. For example, you could ask that this convergence is uh, in some, has some flavor. It can be exponential convergence, Diophantine convergence, so requiring the sequence have some properties. Likewise, you can also ask things like, I don't know, how often this thing should visit uh, identity? How often this norm should be less than epsilon for a given epsilon? Should uh, Ki could be a quasi-arithmetic sequence, meaning the differences are bounded. And uh, there, there is terminology for such things as well. So for instance, if the sequence is quasi-arithmetic, such maps are called almost periodic. And almost periodic maps are almost identities, for example. Um, and so one can do all of these things, and they result in oftentimes meaningful, uh, uh, meaningful things. Okay. Um, all right, so now, so there is this uh, general thing, as I said, much studied. Um, some, maybe, why can you write down some things about, if I can reach, you may still be curious about why one should care about them. So, for example, Again, I'm not assuming I'm in the symplectic world. Let's say we have a C0 approximate identity, C0 rigid map. A C0 rigid map has the following properties to say the least. Its entropy, topological entropy, is equal to zero. This is actually non-obvious uh, to see that this is the case in, in all dimensions. Uh, it's... Uh, in sort of alluded to in a paper by, by Avila, Fayat, uh, Le Calves, uh, Zhang, Xu, hopefully I'm not for, uh, forgetting any, anyone. Um, all points are recurrent. Okay. For instance, if you have a hyperbolic fixed point, you cannot be a C0 uh, rigid map, C0 identity. These are related to mixing properties, which is again much studied in dynamics. Such a thing cannot be mixing. Okay. Um, a lot more. <laughs> there are, they are, yes? Is M a surface here or? No. Not necessarily. Yeah. Not necessarily. The, of course, this is easier to see in the surface case. Yeah, yeah. But this is this, you will remember, like how Patis explained to us at some point. But uh, it is a recent paper, maybe Victor may correct me here. They, they, they have it in a paper with Avila, uh, 
Why are the look? But they don't really, they don't really explain why it is. But in fact, uh, it is the case, and uh, Patrice so explained to us at some point. That's why I asked if it's a surface, because uh, <laughs> what I remember from that uh, paper is that uh, it, it was focused on surface matter. Uh, what, what no, no, this is this is not necessarily so. This is true okay. in general. Yes, it I'm is positive. It, <laughs> yeah. Right, it's a, it has an elementary proof, okay. but it's, yes. uh, it's not yes. obvious, yes. actually. Yes. Uh, so, so yes. uh, again, the, the part, we, we can talk about it later, but it's, it's mm -hmm. half a page proof, but not obvious, actually. Uh, th there is more here, uh, the things that I am not going to talk about. For instance, uh, there is a famous uh, conjecture called Hilbert Smith conjecture. Uh, it's about... Uh, whether or not a, a locally compact uh, group acting um, on a manifold in an effective way, whether or not this is a Lie group. These questions are all related to s if something is a, I don't know, C1 almost periodic map, etc. So uh, there is more connections here. So uh, again, the point I'm basically trying to make is that these questions are interesting and related to uh, a variety of other phenomena, uh, some of which maybe some of us we've never even heard of before. <laughs> okay, so let me focus on the Hamiltonian case now. Uh, before I. I didn't forget anything. All right, so let's, I need to erase the board. Is this the better one? No longer. <laughs> so. So there is an apparent, um, this brings us uh, to the following thing. So let's now focus on the symplectic world and the Hamiltonian case. Okay. Uh, so there is basically appar an apparent connection, I have to say. Uh, between manifolds which admits pseudo rotations, yes. Uh, why do you call it an approximate at any element? Uh, because like, where's the because this is the norm is distance to the identity, yeah, so this thing converges identity in the group. So, like, if you multiply it within by another element in the group, what happens? Uh, like times psi. Well, I guess anything can happen. Okay, so it it all depends on phi, if you just randomly multiply. So then why call G a group? Which G? There? Uh, yeah, you had it as a group. Yeah. yeah. But it's not an identity, it's not like an identity element in the group, is it? Or close to an identity element in the group? It is the close, it is, it is the identity, yeah. Like identity map for Hamiltonian diffeomorphisms, yeah. Maybe, uh, please ask me this, maybe I'm misunderstanding. <laughs> it is the identity, yeah. Okay, so there is a uh, relation between um, sort of pseudo rotations, or maybe I should say uh, a non established relation, uh, manifolds. admitting uh, gamma rigid maps and uh, sort of, let's put it this way, or gamma approximate identities and the ones that admit pseudo rotations. OK? 
Okay. So SU the rotation, many of you know the definition. So I'm going to stick to the uh, definition that if it, let's call a Hamiltonian diffeomorphism SU the rotation if it has the minimal possible number of periodic points, and that this number is finite. So um, P with maybe later on I'll use so periodic points. Minimal and finite. Okay, so for example, for CPN, a pseudo rotation would be a map with exactly m plus one fixed points. These will be the minimal and equal to the fixed points. Okay. More generally, any manifold that admits a circle action, torus section with isolated fixed points admits such pseudo rotations. And uh, the important thing is the following. So yes, this is the case. Our examples are like manifolds admitting circle actions, torus actions, etc. But one interesting thing is that we have uh, also, so, so maybe it's worth writing. Uh, exists for amps with S1 or more generally tor sections with isolated fixed points like CPN, Grassmannians, etc. Um, these are generally the dynamically uninteresting ones. It, they basically correspond to whatever that means, integrable uh, dynamical system. But there are dynamically interesting pseudo-rotations. And the first example of these guys go back to the so-called um, anosov katok pseudo-rotations coming from 73. And these pseudo-rotations have exactly three ergodic measures and therefore dense orbits. So uh, they have interest. This is kind of, of interest in low dimensional dynamics, of course, because they have interesting dynamics, yet zero entropy, for example, which measures complexity of the system. And more recently, so this was for S2. This was along the generalizing the uh, anosov katov conjugation method, which is the method to construct this. It was also constructed by Luru and Seifatini for all such manifolds. This is like a recent, maybe from 2020 or something. And even more recently, uh, a work of, again, Sopan and... My handwriting is unreadable, is it? Oh, I, I should just write bigger, okay. I am approaching zero. Okay, so maybe um, there is yet a more recent work where uh, I don't want to write Dushan's last name incorrectly. So uh, let's write it this way. So what Dushan and Sophan did is basically took the <laughs> essential points which are captured by all non pseudo rotations and uh, in a nice way defined something, gave the definition of something, what's called an, un and they called it Anosov Kato pseudo rotations. I, I'm not going to write down what the definition is, but the key point is that all non pseudo rotations are in this category, basically. So they give uh, like this definition. So, uh, and uh, all, uh, basically all known PRs are here at the moment. But I should say that, I don't know, the same CPN can still have another pseudo rotation. This is not known. <laughs> so it's just that uh, the, the known ones we know of are in this category. OK, so what do we know? Um, I need to somehow 
bring this back to. Uh, so it's good that I now introduce you the rotations. So now let's go back to our gamma rigid maps because these basically are the only known source of gamma rigid maps or gamma approximate identities at the moment. So uh, some remarks and known things here. Uh, what is known in this uh, case. So first of all, the study of uh, C0 rigidity by symplectic tools goes back to Brahman. So this is uh, in dimension two. where he studied pseudo rotations of the disk um, and showed that an, an irrational rotation of the disk, uh, if the rotation number is exponentially Liouville, then it is in fact C0 rigid. Okay. So um, D2 um, irrational rotation plus rotation number is exponentially Liouville implies that this is C0 rigid. Okay. And then what else? So I need to go here, right? And then gamma rigidity. Bashak, yeah. Not write pseudo rotation, right? I haven't written or you wrote irrational rotation. I meant pseudo rotation. Yeah, yeah. I meant pseudo rotation. Yeah. A PR. Thank you. <laughs> so it this way. Okay, and then gamma rigidity. I believe it goes back to my work with Victor, again via symplectic tools. And gamma rigidity um, in higher dimensions for CPN. Some, in particular, generalizing some results of Brahman to CPN. Uh, this goes back to our work from maybe 2018-19. Um, right. So uh, I'll say actually a few more words about these things. Another remark is <laughs> there are situations where gamma norm is known to be C0 continuous. OK. So this is uh, Vitar Bo for R2N, and then uh, Sobhan for surfaces, closed surfaces, and then um, Shelukin for CPN. I'm going to forget something here. Of course, uh, it is. In the aspherical case, symplectically aspherical, this is uh, Buchowski, Humilia, and Seifertini. And then it's also known in the negative monotone case more recently. And this is Kawamoto. So in these cases, what you can say is that C0 AI uh, is also a gamma AI because of the continuity properties of these things. Okay. Um, other facts. 
An observation due to Poltorovich, for instance, is that if you have a symplectically aspherical manifold, you cannot have a C1 almost uh, identity. Um, here is a question. Again, we can attribute it to Leonid. Uh, let's say I have a symplectically aspherical manifold. Does it admit a gamma AI? So something as simple as that is, is still uh, not known. So let me try to speed up a little bit. I already said, uh, as interesting as they are, such maps uh, are rare. <coughs> OK. So basically, the only known examples uh, are all pseudo rotations not necessarily the ones that are coming from the anasov katox blah, blah, method uh, of CPN. And what is identified as anasov katox pseudo rotations uh, in the paper by uh, Dushan and Sopan. Okay. Um, why is it good to know? As I said, because you can say a lot of non-trivial things about them. Uh, ab about, you know, th they have very non-trivial dynamical consequences. I will just state, maybe not talk much about them due to lack of time, but uh, it's very timely to <laughs> say some of them. So one non-trivial consequence is what's known as uh, Lagrangian Poincare recurrence. So Lagrangian Poincare conjec recurrence conjecture is conjectured um, by again uh, Victor and Claude independently. You claim the following thing for some sequence of Ki's, so for some conjecture, essentially wide open still. <laughs> so for some sequence ki going to infinity, the images of a Lagrangian submanifold under the iterations of phi will intersect itself. By the way, I didn't say it, but in all, this, all the talk, you assume that phi is not identity. <laughs> and uh, in this case, of course, you want to assume that uh, um, L is displaceable, right? Otherwise, this is trivial. All right. Now I've written down just the bare bones. You can actually say more. You can say conjecture how frequently these intersections happen, etc. And we have results along these lines. So this conjecture um, and the density, the frequency of this intersection is can be bounded from below by some symplectic capacity, homological capacity, or as uh, remarked in, uh, again, the same Kislev and Shalukin paper bounded from below by, uh, not just that, by some constant and to the power of uh, the minimal area of a holomorphic disk uh, on L. So there, there is more to this story. And we know the following thing. This thing holds um, for pseudo rotations of CPN. This is our work with Victor in the same paper. And then it also holds for all anasov katok pseudo rotations uh, of toric symplectic manifolds. This is uh, I'm pretty sure this is incorrect pronunciation, so I'm, my apologies. And there is another class, actually, we know that this holds. 
Um, I'm going to keep it separate, and this is the work of Polterovich and Shulukin. So in these cases, the Hamiltonian diffeomorphisms are pseudo-rotations, but Lagrangian can be anything. And in this case, you're in dimension four, if I remember correctly. Uh, phi can be anything, but the Lagrangian is specific. Uh, let me write it this way. And it is, of course, natural to think of this as related to packing type questions. And in fact, this result uh, is, comes more from packing, I think, sort of. This is uh, another So now, how do we prove this? So I want to tie this story about, uh, tie this story back to gamma rigid maps or gamma approximate identities. The essence of this in both of these proofs, so this is 18, this is 22, is actually what we prove is that a pseudo, in, let me talk about our work, a pseudo rotation, any pseudo rotation of CPN is a gamma approximate identity. And once you have a gamma approximate identity, from this you can obtain the Lagrangian Poincare recurrence uh, theorem. So this follows from, uh, let me now write it gamma rigidity. Okay. Um, If you know that I'm assuming I still have 10 minutes with the time it took to time me up to this thing, so not five, but 10. <laughs> Another thing that we know is if a gamma rigid map, this rigidity happens sufficiently fast, we know that this implies C0 rigid. This is again observation of uh, Sopan and uh, went into their paper with Dushan. And maybe more relevant uh, is the following story. There has been a lot of recent developments, and we will hear some talks about the strong closing lemma. I'm not going to tell you what this is. You will hear all about it, something about it, at least starting this afternoon. So uh, strong closing lemma holds for gamma rigid maps. I may be forgetting some assumptions or anything. So this is a recent result of Cinelli and Seyfertini. Okay. And um, from this, uh, in particular, it holds for the uh, anasov katok pseudo rotations of CPN, and you can extract, for instance, that it holds for ellipsoids. So, and in fact, it holds for more classes of maps than just ellipsoids, because this class includes some pseudo rotations which are dynamically interesting. Okay, so this is actually very uh, remarkable, I would say. Okay, so let me write down a couple of results now, as Edward does. I, I won't get to say much about proofs, but I can say just a couple of lines in each case. Here is a theorem. Let's call it theorem one. It is, as I said, maybe 22, 23, 22, this version. OK, so if phi is a Hamiltonian diffeomorphism, m is any closed symplectic manifold, uh, maybe some, you know, you need some fluor theoretic machinery. So if you know 
if you have enough hyperbolicity, then you're going to get a lower bound for gamma bars. So uh, let's write it this way. Number of hyperbolic periodic points of phi greater than the dimension of homology. Of course, this is not surprising for people who work with these things. This implies that gamma bar of phi is bounded from below. Okay, so in other words, gamma is bounded away from. So let me just remind you, this is lim if of gamma phi to the k as k goes to infinity. Okay, so this sequence of gamma phi to the k is bounded away from zero. Okay, so this is one theorem. I can say a few words about the proof if I have time. Let me also write a second theorem. And the second theorem is going to tell us that this happens, this assumption actually happens quite often. So the set of Hamiltonian diffios having this property contains this infinite open and dense set. So you certainly expect this to happen most often. Now, um, there are several consequences of this theorem. For instance, for S2, I don't know. Pardon me? It could be C1. Uh, I just wrote down the version that I am sure that it is correct. Uh, but but we, I think it, it may be C1, in fact. Sort of. I just wanted to write down something I'm sure that it is correct. Um, okay. Yes. Ah, that's very. Thank you, Victor. Uh, I, I, let me say that some things here do overlap and maybe follow. There was a paper in back in uh, 2000, maybe 21, by Sugimoto where. The title, I think, was on the generic only conjecture. So some uh, these of these conditions, actually some situations here that one needs to deal with overlap with the things that uh, Sugimoto does or deals with. So let me definitely give credit here. So uh, quite a bit of stuff is already worked out here. Uh, our argument is somewhat different. In fact, we use strong closing lemma to, to get this result, interestingly. Uh, there are lots of corollaries, for instance, uh, of this theorem. Uh, for S2, you can say, um, I don't know, strongly non degenerate uh, rigidity if and only if phi is a pseudo rotation. Okay? Again, there are entropy-related consequences, etc. I can write some of them. But maybe I would like to say just a few words about the proof of this theorem. Where do we get this uh, positivity? So there are two ingredients of this theorem. One of them is energy crossing, that to approach a hyperbolic point, you need a via fuller trajectory you need to have a certain amount of energy. This is bounded from below, uh, a priori bounded from below. And this bound is independent of iterations. Of course, it is extremely important. We are dealing with iterations here. Okay, so one ingredient in the proof energy crossing, crossing energy maybe. So energy crossing um, 
gives, it, gives us this, uh, in the language of Bart, so to speak, it gives us the fact that um, basically if you want to connect, if there is uh, any bar connecting to related to hyperbolic point, with hyperbolic thing will be the end point, must have energy at least, uh, or barcode bar length, at least as much as needed as the crossing energy. Okay, so this, this gives us uh, a finite bar. So, and then the next ingredient here is again the same, going back to uh, Kislev Shulukin's work, that the boundary depth for any Hamiltonian diffeomorphism is, let's write it this way, bounded from above by gamma phi. All in all, what one and two gives me the following thing. So, okay, so that's a flow trajectory possibly with endpoint a hyperbolic orbit. This is bounded away from zero. I'll stop in a second. So what you get is this. Here is the boundary depth for all iterations. Above bounded by gamma of phi, uh, uh, gamma phi to the L, below bounded by C infinity, my crossing energy, to speak. Uh, and then the fact that we get a finite bar, of course, it comes from the assumption that you have more than dimension many hyperbolic points, uh, because this is this. Infinite bars give you the dimension. If anything extra needs to give you something finite. And I am expecting someone to make this remark. Is it the time to use triangle inequality? It is, pretty much. So at this stage, to finish the proof, you need to do triangle inequality and argue by contradiction, basically. Thank you. Thank you, Bazak, for this uh, beautiful talk. Uh, are there questions? Actually, I have one. So uh, in your theorem one, you, you say that periodic, uh, certain number of hyperbolic periodic points imply your rigidity. Yes. Do you have such implication for uh, having topological entropy? There is a similar result by, I think, Le Calvez and Sambarino for surfaces. And in your case? Y yes, there are definitely. Uh, Connections. So I don't know. There are just a lot of connections. What he is asking is, uh, assume the topological entropy is positive. Then, uh, yes, gamma bar is positive. Uh, the, uh, yes, certainly. Okay. That, the, the, I mean, that comes from, uh, for surfaces, all of this entropy comes from horseshoes. Mm -hmm. You have infinitely many hyperbolic points, in particular periodic points. Yes, you do have. Yeah, there were a variety of yeah, corollaries that I did. Yeah. Yeah, the question was, can you, if you have enough hyperbolic points, can you prove that the point of the can be limited? Huh, no, no, yeah, if that's the question, no, you cannot. <laughs> but uh, like, you were supposed to make a conjecture. <laughs> <laughs> Please do make the conjecture. <laughs> Yes, 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 yes. I, I sort of wrote something like that, but anyway, <laughs> yeah. Other questions? Uh, yes, uh, just give me a second, I don't want to. So the game there is, um, okay, so what do you do? So the main ingredient there is actually Birkhoff-Moser uh, theorem, I have to say. And Birkhoff-Moser theorem, in a way, that is uh, actually worked out in a paper by Marie-Claude Arnaud. And Marie-Claude Arnaud tells you that if you have an elliptic orbit in a neighborhood, you can get infinitely many uh, hyperbolic orbits. 
which is a bit uh, more than what the regular brick of Moser theorem says. So here what we do is, so you, you take a phi and if you have like, uh, and obviously you need to deal with the case where this guy doesn't have any infinity neighborhood. Uh, uh, well, this guy should, in any neighborhood, should have some gamma rigid maps in it. So then what you can do is use the strong closing lemma. You can perturb this thing and get a periodic orbit because of the uh, Sopan and Erman's results. Okay, then you can also further assume that this thing is uh, non-degenerate by another small perturbation. And then uh, you ask yourself, what this kind of periodic orbit you have in this? So if it is non-hyperbolic, then you should go and apply Marie Coulomb's result in the neutral directions. And eventually, in some finite number of steps, you're going to get a hyperbolic orbit. And you can also do it, uh, keep doing it, to get the sufficient amount of hyperbolic points needed here. And if you end up with um, a hyperbolic point as a result of the strong closing lemma and further perturbation, well, you can keep doing the perturbation. You can do it in other ways and just get as many as. So basically, getting a, a certain number of fixed number of hyperbolic uh, points is just not a big problem, <laughs> basically, this way. So just roughly, this is the idea. No, there is no assumption. No, there is no assumption. Uh, something I wanted to say, <laughs> thank you for asking. Uh, Igor and uh, Marcel and maybe one more student of Igor, they, there are also some results, as far as I know, concerning prime iterations of phi, right? If I remember correctly. Again, uh, the, some kind of a bounce from below. But uh, it's like a forthcoming result, as far as I know. <laughs> so I didn't, I didn't know how to quote it. But, but let's just keep in mind that in this case, if you just deal with prime iterations, of course, gamma bar, this lower limit, can still be 0 in principle. Right? So you can still have a sequence without prime iterations where things go to 0. But there are other results, maybe some forthcoming results. OK, I suggest we keep extra questions for, for coffee. So thank you again. Thank you.